My name is Mark Gerdish. I'm Chief of Cardiothoracic Surgery at Franciscan Health in Indianapolis, Indiana. I do think a good way of putting it is the different faces of mitral valve disease because in the context of just saying a valve leaks or it's blocked, you don't really understand kind of the organic changes that are involved in the valve and how it relates to the rest of the heart and what the expectation should be for the patient and what can be done for it. Probably the thing that gets talked about the most is mitral insufficiency, the leaking mitral valves. It's really kind of the prize of mitral valve surgery in the sense that uh, nearly 100% of those patients will be repaired and will be restored to a normally functioning valve. And we can do it minimally invasively. We have patient recovery that's great. And the whole process is pretty well established step by step. There are also patients that make up a large swath outside of standard myxomatous degenerative leaking valves that have either mixed disease, meaning that, yeah, they have myxomatous disease, that's kind of classic degenerative billowy valve, soft leaflets, but they also have, for example, calcification in the valve, or they have changes in the architecture of the valve beyond those changes. So those are mixed changes. So for example, someone can have myxomatous degenerative disease, but also have changes in the shape of their heart that would give them what we call functional mitral regurgitation due to the change in geometry of the heart, so that pulls down on the valve, changes the position of the leaflets. The assessment of those patients becomes more complicated. In addition, we have now, we see more and more patients that have uh, extensive calcification of the mitral valve. And there are probably a couple of reasons that we're seeing it more. Number one is because we're paying more attention. Number two is because people are living longer and as you age, you're at greater risk of calcification, especially around the valve and we call the annulus or the place where the leaflets attach. So it's becoming more of a disease entity. In the past, leaflets not moving well or obstruction to the valve was largely described in the realm of rheumatic disease. So we still see rheumatic disease. For example, our rural where people may don't see the doctor as much, so in their early life they could have a strep throat and not have it treated. And that's what leads then to rheumatic fever. And rheumatic fever leads to rheumatic valve disease because the patient develops antibodies to their own valve. And as a result of that, the leaflets become thick, immobile. Blocked mitral valves has always been kind of the focus there. And if we look worldwide, Rheumatic mitral valve disease is still the most common mitral valve disorder. Someone can have an echocardiogram, it can say the valve is leaking, but that doesn't mean it's a myxomatous degenerative valve. You can have a rheumatic mitral valve that leaks and isn't obstructed, but it's a function of the leaflets not moving enough, not getting together, not closing properly. So uh, changes in what we call coaptation, where the leaflets overlap, can be a function of the leaflets being too free to move, right? So that's myxomatous degenerative disease where the leaflet goes like this and the blood comes up from the ventricle into the atrium. Or it can be that the leaflets can't move and they can't reach each other. So you don't have that overlap and that can be the problem. So now let me give you both. So now you've got one leaflet that moves too much. You've got another leaflet that doesn't move enough and can that be remedied, right? So sometimes we're gonna bring this leaflet down and then we might expand this leaflet to make it bigger so that we can have that relationship reestablished. Again, many faces of mitral valve disease. The other category that I think really mystifies patients that they can't really get full information on because it's difficult to understand is the general concept of secondary mitral valve disease. So mitral insufficiency driven by other conditions. So for example, I talked earlier, change in the shape of the ventricle leading to a leaking valve. Those are people who for some reason the lower chamber of the heart has enlarged, it's dilated. Now that can, that can just happen to people. They get idiopathic cardiomyopathy. It can be driven by comorbid conditions like hypertension. It can be a function of coronary artery disease, injury to the heart and change in the shape. And then they go on to have a leaking mitral valve. So among the spectrum of disorders, the faces 
of mitral disease and endocarditis. So any valve can be infected. And uh, we still strive to reconstruct that valve. Often we can use whatever tissues left after whatever destruction has been done by the infection, patch the area that we have to clean out from the infection, reconstruct the valve, and then we still resupport it with a, a valve ring. So I think it's important to recognize that uh, any time that you have a moderate amount of normal tissue still present in the valve, the goal is going to be to integrate that into a repair and save the valve. And that includes an infection when you have leaflet or tissue around the valve that's destroyed. Other conditions, for example, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Basically, when people uh, have a very thick heart, and then part of that very thick heart obstructs the blood flow getting out of the left ventricle out to the body, the blood accelerates as it leaves the ventricle, it's passing by the mitral valve on its way out, and that high velocity jet will actually kind of grab onto the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve and it gets stuck down there. So now, you got to fix that, of course. Now sometimes it's just taking the muscle out, changing the muscle architecture. Sometimes you repair the valve. But there will be instances where that has been like that so long that the anterior leaflet has literally become beat up and doesn't function well anymore. Depending on uh, the patient's overall physiology, uh, what the opportunity looks like, how old they are, what other conditions they have, we may become very aggressive about taking that calcium out and then rebuilding the valve so that we give them a repaired valve. In someone else, let's say perhaps an older person, after about 80, 82 years of age, we don't see the, a survival benefit for those people, so we have science that tells us when we're supposed to be very kind of aggressive or uh, do an exotic, what I would call an exotic repair. In that patient, our goal would be to not disturb the anatomy as much as possible. We avoid disrupting the anatomy, but then replace the valve with an, a generously sized, uh, coarse tissue valve in somebody that's that age. And I would add to that, that when we do that, we're trying to do anything we can to not change the geometry of the heart. If, for example, a valve has to be replaced and you cut out a leaflet or both leaflets or some of the leaflet tissue, now the connections between those leaflets and the ventricle, the chamber, which is normally shaped like this, right? It's like an upside down ice cream cone because that's how the muscle is. So, and when the heart squeezes, it does this and pushes the blood out. So now, if I cut the connection to the papillary muscles here and they drop down, heart starts to do this, it changes shape. It's really important that if the valve has to be replaced, that everything possible is done to maintain that relationship. And so we will literally reconnect those papillary muscles in some fashion up to the upper portion of the heart so that the shape is maintained. Still, repair remains our goal because we know that uh, once we, you, I've often said this and people quote me sometimes, that when we change the valve, we're trading diseases. So when, once you implant a prosthetic valve, you've changed the really bad disease the patient has for a, little bit le for a lesser disease where they now have a prosthetic valve that they have to deal with either the continuous blood thinner or the degeneration, deterioration of that valve. And the, the impact of that is different for different people based on their comorbidities and their age. When we're approaching a mitral valve that's complex, we have to orchestrate our thought process around everything about the patient and what we're doing. It never is one size fits all. We never sacrifice a perfect repair for a small incision. So when we get into these more exotic repairs, we're taking calcium out, we're changing more of the architecture of the valve, then we might think of moving over to a larger exposure just because we know that we're gonna get the job done. But it's always a process that requires uh, real intent to design what you're gonna do to the valve. And there are cases where, for example, someone who's very old or very debilitated where we will even take a transcatheter aortic valve, flip it upside down and put it inside of there. So there are transcatheter scenarios even through your leg where we'll put a transcatheter valve in a calcified donut of a mitral valve. You can do it surgically, take out one leaflet, implant that upside down transcatheter aortic valve. 
And now there are technologies that they're working on, of course, that are pipeline that are going to be completely percutaneous mitral valves. But it's still going to be extremely difficult to, pay, to treat these patients because of the circumferential calcification and the limitations of the space in there. Because we always have to finish up, hopefully, with a big valve. So my recommendations for the patient are first, any abnormality on an echocardiogram has to be explained. So, and then any change has to be explained. We really need to become intimate with that with respect to what it means to the particular patient. So the patient has to seek that information from their cardiologist and from their heart surgeon. They have to have a conversation, a dialogue. It doesn't mean that you have to talk about it for hours. It means you have to explain what you see on the echocardiogram so that you know what the plan is going forward. Hi everybody, it's Adam. I hope you enjoyed that video. And don't forget, you can always subscribe to our YouTube channel. Watch the next two educational videos coming up on your screen or click the blue button to visit heartvalvesurgery.com.